question from uh, Brian Nari. And just one moment here. Okay. So yeah, I'd like to, to welcome everyone to our uh, first meeting in 2022. Our presentation, as you probably all know, is uh, Brian Nari talking about mill races in St. Catharines. We'll get to that in a moment. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, to start things is number one, our new membership year or our membership year starts in January 1st. So for those who haven't uh, uh, purchased their membership, I encourage you to do so again the, for the 2022 year where memberships are now open. So you can go to our website at catherineshistory.ca. You can see information on there. There's also information on each newsletter. Uh, on that. So again, I encourage everyone to purchase their membership for the 2022 year that allows us to help put on programs such as these, as well as to uh, do our newsletter. So uh, important we keep that up. So I wanted to make a note of that. One other announcement I wanted to make is, um, it may have seen in the newspaper or in the obituaries recently, one of our directors, longtime member, John Calvert passed away last month. John, as I said, was a, lo a long time director and, and going back a ways, I understand, I think he was president for a while too. John, uh, he made a lot of contribution to the historical society over the years. So I just wanted to take a moment uh, to recognize uh, John and his passing and uh, everything he had done for the society. Uh, there will be something in our newsletter on that as well too. Um, so I think those are all my uh, preliminary announcements. So I think we can start in our presentation now for introduction and for that I will turn it over to Gail. Thank you, David. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to read from what I have in front of me. Um, born in St. Catharines, uh, Brian Narhi, our friend, uh, is of Finnish ancestry and very proud of it, and rightly so. He attended Grantham High School. He studied classics at Brock University, which is kind of an interesting thing. Then did graduate studies in comparative literature at U of T. And he worked in the Toronto Land Registry uh, Office before switching to archaeology. Uh, he worked for the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, and he is now still with the Archaeological Services Incorporated, a very well-known firm. He's been a long-standing member of the city's Heritage Advisory Committee and Heritage Permits Advisory Committee. In fact, he's been the chair of both for many years. And uh, he was formerly with the Regional Heritage Committee, which I don't think many of us knew existed, former museum board member, Mayholm board member, Port Weller Residents Association board member. And he, along with uh, uh, various other historian friends of his, has published various articles and he's contributed to books. And he says, uh, he's a vegetable, vegetable and cat grower extraordinaire, avid reader and genealogist. But I would like to say that he's also the person that the St. Catherine Standard always goes to to ask him about anything history and heritage, it's always Brian Narhi because of his fabulous in-depth research. He's done work for the St. Catharines Heritage Advisory Committee on the late lamented uh, Welland House and Rodman Hall and many other, many other things. Uh, so I ask you to welcome our friend and board member, Brian Narhi. Can you see it now? Perfect. Ah, okay, great. Anyway, well, thank you everybody for, for tuning up for this uh, this talk, despite these few uh, technical glitches. Um, my talk, of course, is, is uh, Mills Should Be Built Thereon, uh, the Hydraulic Raceways and the St. Catharines Economy in the 19th Century. And just to give you um, a little prelude, um, in 2024 to 2029, uh, we're going to be having the bicentennial of the, uh, the first well and canal. So this is sort of a, an introductory taste of you know, things that are going to be coming up. Uh, the first slide that you see here on the screen, of course, is the, um, as one of the uh, buildings that uh, stood on Geneva Street, uh, right on the uh, hydraulic raceway. And you can just see a little bit of the raceway coming through here in front of the building. Uh, I think this was the old Nor part of the old Norris roller mill. Uh, the other picture that you see here is uh, a map of St. Catharines from 1876. And I've often wondered what this squiggly little line is that goes down along here between St. Catharines and Meryton. 
And after I did the, uh, the research for this talk, it dawned on me that that is the, the beginning of the hydraulic raceway. And then it just continues off in this direction uh, through the downtown and then emptied back out into the, uh, the 12 mile creek. Uh, so during the mid 19th century, the town of St. Catharines was described as a place of much trade. Uh, the prosperity and the growth of the community was attributed not only to the Welland Canal, but the hydraulic raceways played a, a role. And uh, as a, uh, a show of that, you've got the, the, um, the masthead for the Farmer's Journal newspaper and the, the St. Catharines Constitutional had a similar one uh, that highlights the industries and the canal and the raceways. And the, the engraving on the, uh, the right-hand side here uh, is a view of St. Catharines from about 1850, showing the Welland Canal you know, looping around uh, a little bit of a, a raceway in the front here. And of course, all the, the industries in the downtown core in the, uh, in the background. Uh, as we all know, the canal was the, uh, uh, the, the brainchild of Mr. William Hamilton Merritt. Uh, I don't think we have to say much more about him. I think everybody, most of the audience here knows, knows who he was. Uh, as early as 1818, he envisioned uh, the construction of a hydraulic ditch, which would convey water from the Chippewa Creek to St. Catharines, and it would help to power the mills on the 12 Mile Creek. Uh, two of the more important ones were John DeCue's mill and the, the Adams mill. Uh, the, the unfortunate thing is that they suffered from an irregular water supply, and during the summers, uh, if it was dry, they would sit idle. Uh, in 1823, during the construction of the Erie Canal, uh, Merritt's plans began to expand to that of having, uh, from instead of having just a, a hydraulic race, to having a barge canal and then a ship canal, which would link the lakes. Uh, the route followed the 12 Mile Creek and Dix Creek. Uh, it bypassed DeCue, and of course, this caused uh, some locals to accuse Merritt of self interest, and some of the subscribers of Mr. Merritt's ditch withdrew their support. And starting in 1831, Merritt tried to distance himself from accusations that he was making the canal, that he made the canal go through St. Catharines because he had mill interests there. Uh, the canal construction required land to be expropriated along its route. Uh, arbitration hearings were held in St. Catharines in 1826. Uh, the property owners are not fully compensated for the loss of their land or for, for damage caused by flooding because the, the canal directors said that the benefits brought by the canal far outweighed any losses that they had. Uh, so here you'll see someone like John Soper considered unanimously that the advantages were equal to the disadvantages or Robert Dietrich only getting two pounds, 10 shillings per acre. But then you see Mr. Thomas Merritt and William Hamilton Merritt, they're getting 600 pounds. And of course you wonder, hmm, yeah, how'd you manage to do that, Bill? You've got a bit of explaining to do. Uh, but Merritt never lost sight of the original goal of his project, which was to provide a reliable water source for the mills. Uh, the water from the Chippewa Creek was inadequate for the purposes of the canals plus the mills. So in 1829, they constructed a feeder canal, which brought water from the Grand River, but they also saw Lake Erie as being a limitless mill pond, uh, which would bring lots of water into the system. So the canal was straightened out to Port Colborne in 1833. Thereafter, the canal ran more efficiently and it had uh, two, two southerly exits, the one being at, at Port Maitland. Uh, the channel, um, the narrow channel followed by the canal and its towpaths at St. Catharines meant that there was limited space for the establishment of mills and factories, uh, which you know, would have turned the village into an economically self-sufficient community. And the solution uh, that was proposed was to build a hydraulic raceway. And that was uh, the suggestion of Henry Middleberger in, in 1829. Uh, Middleberger, of course, was one of our leading businessmen. Uh, he came here in 1821. He was in charge of the post office. Uh, he was a merchant miller and became a banker. Uh, I thought I had a picture of Henry Middleberger. Couldn't find it, but I had a nice picture of his house, which some of us will uh, remember stood at uh, James and Duke Street. Uh, could have been turned into a museum for the city, but they turned their nose up at it and 
Now, unfortunately, it's demolished. Um, a hydraulic raceway operates on, on a large scale in the same way that an ordinary mill race would. Uh, the race is um, a, a man-made channel which diverts water from some source, a, a creek or a river, and it gra uh, gravitationally conducts it towards a mill along a head race, powers the machinery, and then the wastewater is discharged by means of a tail race back into um, the river or creek. Uh, the hydraulic race drew its waters from upper levels of the well and canal and then discharged it back into the canal at, at a lower level. Um, and of course, much of the hydraulic raceway was built on the expropriated lands that I referred to before. Uh, some of the local residents still weren't convinced about the necessity of having a raceway, so they uh, unflatteringly referred to it as the St. Catherine's Ditch. Uh, perhaps uh, reminding people of the folly of Mr. Merritt's ditch, as they, they called the canal. Uh, one of the unique features of the raceway was that once it reached St. Catharines, it was terraced into the hillside behind St. Paul Street, which made optimum use of the limited space of the steep slope, and that allowed multiple mills and factories to be built there. So industrial establishments are no longer uh, restricted to being strictly uh, on the uh, the canal side. Uh, this, of course, is the Marcus Smith map of 1852, and you can see uh, the upper race coming along here. Then you've got a, a second or a middle race starting here, and then from back around Geneva Street, you had the lower race, and that came all the way down and rounded the corner uh, down past uh, St. Paul Crescent, and we think that the, the, the race actually continued on towards uh, Taylor and Bate, uh, towards the brewery. But one of the uh, spots where it, it dumped into the canal was, was down here by the, uh, uh, where the paper mill and the Lincoln uh, foundry used to be. Uh, the properties on St. Paul Street extended all the way down the slope and they were in private ownership. They were bounded by the, the Welland Canal lands. So in order to allow for the terraced raceway construction, the consent of the property owners uh, was required. And here in 1829, we have the people who were giving their consent for the raceways, uh, Mr. Phelps, Mr. Clendenin, Mr. Sanderson, uh, Butler, and E.S. Adams very begrudgingly said, well, if it comes close to my place, I guess you can build it. And the, the, the raceway, of course, went all through these, these properties, which, you know, butted uh, behind St. Paul Street. Uh, I don't know how true this is, whether this was a misprint or not, but they said that the hydraulic privileges uh, were originally sold for $100,000 in October 1830 to J.B. Yates, uh, who was a major canal stockholder uh, based in, uh, I think, New York City. Uh, Yates was disappointed at the slow progress of the work and he in turn said to the, the well and canal directors, okay, you can, you can have the water rights back, I'll lease them back to you. Uh, that was in 1833. And after that, the uh, construction of the, uh, the raceway uh, started, it, it went fairly quickly after that. And this is a notice uh, that John Clark, uh, the secretary of the well and canal company uh, printed in the, uh, the, the, the journal uh, basically saying that the Welland Canal Company has repurchased the, uh, the water rights from Yates, who was the, the hydraulic company, the original hydraulic company, and that basically we're going to get things underway. Uh, construction of the race, the raceway commenced in 1830. It was supposed to be finished in 1831 to coincide with the start of the shipping season. Uh, we know the names of the, the contractors who worked on the on the, the project, uh, Johnson, McGuire, uh, Bradley, the sex smiths and so on. Uh, the cost was seven cents per yard to, uh, to do the excavation and the embankments. And the, the raceway extended for a, a distance of two and a half, almost three miles. Uh, and the work was to be done, done under the uh, supervision of the engineer or uh, Mr. Oliver Phelps. Uh, Phelps also uh, got a contract in 1830 to build two aqueducts uh, that would uh, convey the raceway across uh, some fairly deep ravines. Uh, one of them was uh, uh, 
what they called Soper's Ravine. It was out by where the golf course is near Hartzell Street. And, um, you know, Phelps uh, contracted to do, to do the work for $1,500. It was to be finished by the beginning of May of 1831. He built this lovely wooden uh, aqueduct or, or bridge across the ravine, which seems to have been uh, um, allowed to have water flowing through it. Uh, even during the, uh, the the winter season, there was some some flow going through it, and of course it froze, and water started uh, water and ice started building up, and in the early spring of 1836, this section of the uh, of the uh, aqueduct actually collapsed. You can actually see a a little gentleman standing there, awestruck at, at the ruins. And this uh, section was uh, severely compromised. Uh, and of course, this is the buildup of, of ice uh, at other spots. Uh, so this had to be repaired fairly quickly to uh, get the mills back up and running in St. Catharines. Uh, extra work was carried out, uh, which included uh, extending the, the raceway and building some sluices. Uh, the cost of the construction is not known because the Welland Canal Company did uh, some irregular bookkeeping practices. Uh, we have three tender uh, documents showing the price at just over $1,100, one at 3,400, one at 6,700. And of course, everybody's friend, William Lyon McKenzie uh, decided he was going to launch an investigation into the management of the Welland Canal Company in 1835. And he questioned the figures for the, what he called the hydraulic ditch uh, from Meriton to St. Catharines, from Centerville to St. Catharines. And even the engineer Francis Hall concluded, it's probable that Mr. Kiefer, the engineer, may be able to explain wherein this great discrepancy originates. But even Francis Hall didn't know what the, um, you know, why the, there was such a difference in the figures. Uh, in 1835, the management of the raceway and the leasing of the water power was turned over to a newly formed company, which was called the St. Catharines Water Power Company, managed by our good friend, Henry Middleberger. Uh, this ad, which was published in the British American Journal of 1835, refers to three separate races uh, in St. Catharines with a total fall of 56 feet from the upper race to the lower race, which would provide uh, power for the mills and the factories. Uh, the new company, of course, spared no expense in self-promotion. There was this little editorial extolling the hydraulic privileges uh, that would be had in St. Catharines. So for any man of, of means who wanted to establish a business, St. Catharines was the place to be. Uh, now, the first uh, Well and Canal hydraulic raceway started in Meriton uh, up in the Mountain Locks Park, uh, roughly between Locks 24 and 25. And there's there's the one lock there. There's the other one there, and the, the raceway started heading off across what is now a residential section of Meriton. Uh, we're told that this stone uh, weir or gate was, uh, which I, I believe still exists, uh, was the place where the uh, raceway started in Meriton. Uh, the image on the, the right here is out of one of the um, the Welland Canal um, plan books uh, showing, I assume that this feature in here beside the cement mill might be this, this stone weir. This is uh, of course a, a second canal feature made out of stone. Uh, the Welland Canal map book showed that the raceway ran northwest from the canal towards Merritt Street, which is shown uh, here as Hartzell Road. So the raceway started up here, came along, and then started coming off down in this direction. Uh, we have a, a lovely plan of, of uh, Meriton from 1867. It was surveyed by George Reichert. Uh, it shows the route of the raceway through that part of, of St. Catharines. Uh, I think it must have joined into a natural waterway before heading towards uh, north towards Lincoln Avenue. So the raceway comes along, it comes down, skirts along the second canal. There's another um, 
spot here beside lock 11 where uh, additional water was taken into the system. Uh, so that portion of, uh, of the uh, raceway seems to be a, a, a later addition. Now this, this thing here, I think, is the natural waterway, uh, an, a, a natural creek that was joined into the system. I think it might have been called Carter's Creek, but I'm not sure about that. So you get an aerial present day uh, view of, of Meriton and the uh, raceway, uh, the hydraulic raceway seems to have started up in here in Mountain Locks Park, crossed Merritt Street down into this point, which is over here, roughly here. And then where these trees are, I think, is, is where the, the raceway started to come through. It came through an, on an angle down here towards Hazel and Bessie Street. Then from there, it crossed uh, uh, Glendale, came all the way down through these, these what is now a residential area uh, to Chestnut Street and Merritt Street. Uh, it crossed along in, in this section, uh, past this structure under Merritt Street and into this uh, low-lying lot. And you see this line in the grass, uh, the archeologist in me is saying, you know, aha, that must be a sign that there's there's a difference between the, the soils uh, in that area. And I think this low-lying area right in here was where the hydraulic race uh, went through. There's a you know, little telltale footprint there. Uh, and of course, that's what it looks like today. Uh, that's, that's the area in there. And then from there, uh, it came, it, it crossed uh, Chestnut, it came down and through Walnut Lane, Walnut Street to Hastings. And then it came down and through this area, crossed under the railway. Um, and then it came along through this kind of, I guess it's a gravelly area now. Uh, now the second well and canal uh, runs along over here. Uh, and there was the, the that secondary entrance to the raceway uh, was between locks 11 and 12. So it came in through here where the, the Hayes Dana uh, plant was joined up and then continued off down in, in this direction. Uh, this is a couple of images of what, you know, the raceways looked like in Meriton, uh, a lovely color postcard from the early 1900s. You can see one of the spillways there. Uh, this seems to be a photograph of the uh, of the same uh, location. Um, this is a, a fire insurance plan from the 1940s. Uh, this is where the uh, raceway started uh, by lock 11 and 12. Uh, this is also now being called Carter's Creek. Uh, came along, crossed under the railroad, went up the side of the, uh, I guess it's the NS and T uh, right of way. Then it crossed back under the railway uh, up to uh, Lincoln Avenue. And uh, this is a, a map of uh, Corporation Plan 6, uh, which was a plan of uh, subdivision for uh, Marathon that was done in the uh, early 1940s. And right in here, you can see this. Uh, this is the same area of the, the raceway starting down here, coming up and going up towards, towards Lincoln Ave. So it's it's fairly easy to follow uh, on this, this aerial view. The the treat area is is the the raceway coming along, crossing under the railroad, uh, coming up to Lincoln Ave, uh, under Lincoln Ave, and then you know continuing on up towards the uh, the, the golf course. Uh, this is about the only section of the raceway that is still actually open and has water sitting in it, and this is. Uh, what you see when you uh, stand on on Lincoln Avenue, just uh, west of the railway, uh, this is the uh, the raceway looking north. That's the raceway looking south. Uh, this is one of the uh, the Welland Canal maps, uh, second Welland Canal maps. Uh, this is Lincoln Ave here. So the the raceway comes along. This is now all the the golf course area. Right here is, you'll see it's called the, uh, the hydraulic aqueduct. That's the, the wooden bridge that partly collapsed 
that I showed in the earlier slide, uh, then uh, the, the raceway did a, a fairly big bend coming up towards Queenston Street and uh, Westchester. Uh, again, this is a, another aerial view. This is the, the golf course. Uh, so the raceway was coming along here, came, whoops, what did I do? There we go. Uh, came along through this area, crossed Claiborne Avenue, uh, and then it skirted along up here behind, behind Herrick uh, Avenue. And I think this area in here was probably where the, uh, where that collapsed bridge was, where the aqueduct was. Uh, once it uh, crossed uh, Herrick or behind Herrick, it came along here along Valley View. Uh, then it went up behind the General Hospital until it reached Oakdale Avenue. And then it started chugging along down this way along Gale Crescent. So the, the raceway went behind these houses on Herrick. This is the view along Valley View um, behind the hospital. Then it came up. This is uh, looking east behind where the, the hospital was demolished. So the raceway would have been coming along in, in this area, coming out to uh, Oakdale and Gale, uh, Gale Crescent. Then it went along Gale. Uh, these are different views along, along Gale Crescent. This is one of the uh, remaining industrial buildings. It, it might have made use of the, uh, the hydraulic power. I don't know. Uh, we're approaching Gale Crescent and Geneva Street. Uh, this is a lovely um, aerial photograph from 1920 uh, showing the, uh, uh, the area east of St. Catharines. You've got the uh, third well and canal back here and the hydraulic raceways coming along uh, up behind the hospital area, you know, crossing Oakdale. And this is Gale Crescent along here. Uh, as a water-filled channel, which, you know, a lot of people find it hard to believe that Gale Crescent was once underwater. And of course, this is the, uh, the second well and canal uh, down in here with uh, the towpaths and things. Uh, here's another close-up of, of Gale Crescent back here as a water-filled hydraulic ditch. Uh, this, of course, is the uh, uh, St. Paul, Geneva, and Queenston, Niagara Street intersection. Uh, that building still exists. Uh, there's no uh, there's no hotel no quite yet at that point. Uh, this is a nice uh, colored map, uh, 1913 map of uh, downtown St. Catharines. And uh, of course you've got the hydraulic ditch, of course indicated uh, coming along all through this area. Uh, you've got things like uh, the, the Paxton Brickyard over here. Um, and of course, other, other canal side industries, uh, the, the gas company, uh, Packard Electric, and all sorts of mills, the, the Flex, Flex Hume Signs Company, uh, the Kinleith Paper Mill. Um, so the, the, the raceway attracted all sorts of uh, businesses to the area. Uh, by 1836, the, the three separate races behind St. Paul Street were complete. Uh, repairs had been made to the collapsed aqueduct, uh, so uh, you know businesses could the mills could be up and running. Uh, this map uh, is the earliest map uh, of St. Catharines that shows the raceways. Um, the race is coming along here. Unfortunately, um, the map was damaged right in this area. Uh, part of the linen had broken off, uh, so the exact route. Uh, has been lost, uh, but um, and the map also shows a, a little detail in the bottom corner, showing the the upper race, and this of course is Phelps's mill, and you've got the the second and the third races with the drop, uh, you know, the drop down in, in levels. Uh, then you've got the lower race uh, that started uh, at Geneva Street uh, above Lock Four, and uh, went around towards uh, Taylor and Bates. And you'll notice here that there's a, a drop of 16 feet between these two levels. Uh, there's a drop of 20 feet between these levels. Uh, there's another 10 feet here. So when uh, uh, the, they advertise that there's 56 feet of drop 
between the, the levels, uh, they actually showed it on, on this uh, inset. Uh, of course, the, the Marcus Smith map, I've already uh, referred to that, uh, showing all the different, uh, uh, the, the upper, middle, and lower race. Uh, you've got things like the Grantham Mills, uh, Merritt's Well and Canal Mills down here, uh, you know, the various industries uh, showing up. Uh, the uh, uh, Brosius map uh, of 1875, again, showing the raceway coming along here. Uh, you've got Phelps's Mill uh, right in the line of Geneva Street, uh, which was a hindrance to a lot of people for, for many years because they couldn't, you know, extend the street. Um, and the, the different levels of, of the races uh, finally ending up down here at the, at the paper mill. Uh, Junius uh, extolled the virtues of the water power uh, in St. Catharines. This was from uh, uh, his column in uh, 1856, uh, talking about uh, all the different uh, businesses that were, were here, uh, barrels of flour, machine shops, workshops, woolen factories, carriage factories, uh, producing agricultural and mechanical implements of all sorts. Uh, if you're interested in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a, a book that outlines all the different industries that were um, attracted because of the canal and the raceway, we have this uh, survey of the Welland Canal Industrial Corridor. And uh, one of the authors of this uh, study was Rob Peel, who's one of my uh, colleagues at ASI. This book is available at uh, special collections uh, at the downtown library. Uh, the nice part about the book is that it has lots of maps in it. And each map, uh, like the one map is made out of almost like a parchment or, or tissue paper. So it's transparent. So he'll have um, uh, the historic water course, you know, in this case, you know, the canal and the hydraulic <coughs> raceways that are marked. And when you flip that map over onto the, the, the facing page, uh, you'll have the different industrial establishments shown. So when the, the one map is overlaid on the other one, you can actually see uh, the two of them juxtaposed uh, in relation to the, the modern streetscape and the, the historic uh, watercourse. Uh, he also, uh, for each, each map has an inventory of what the buildings are that are shown on the map and then a detailed uh, inventory sheet saying what they were and uh, a little bit of uh, thumbnail history about them. Uh, businesses, uh, you know, developed very quickly. Uh, one of them was uh, Thomas McIntyre's uh, chair factory. Uh, he, of course, he later became a, a coffin manufacturer of, uh, you know, Paulson English fame. Uh, his factory was totally consumed by fire in 1842. Uh, this article mentions that Thomas Towers uh, foundry building narrowly escaped being burnt. McIntyre was completely uninsured and the widow Morrow and her children who apparently had some interest in the building were left totally uh, helpless and uh, destitute as a result of uh, the, the building burning. Uh, the raceway would suffer from periodic breaks, which would require immediate repairs, and this would result in mills being closed, and sometimes the closure could last for several days. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, Gibson's Cloth Factory and the Grantham Mills uh, were shut down, and uh, um, Adams Tannery, and it said that, you know, they've, they've lost three or four days' work. And, of course, in, in 1847, when you know you weren't being paid for time off, uh, that uh, certainly hurt the uh, pocketbooks of uh, uh, the different uh, workers. Uh, moving along, uh, this of course is uh, where the the mill stood in the middle of uh, Geneva Street, Geneva and Race. Uh, the mill is now long gone. The race continued on through here, and gee, if you ever wondered why it's called Race Street, well, that's because the hydraulic race went through there. Uh, this is looking down Race Street towards Carlisle, so the uh, the race dropped down uh, through this area. Uh, this is where the, the lower race started above Lock 4 on Geneva Street. So you've got the, the canal lock over here, 
the Welland Canal, the second canal going off in this direction. And this was the, the entrance to the, the lower race. So there's water being drawn out of the canal at that point. And you've got, of course, Glen Ridge in the, uh, in the background uh, over this way. This is an aerial view of the same uh, area. That's um, uh, the mill that was in G the middle of Geneva Street. Uh, you've got the, the upper race coming along here. Uh, and the, the middle middle race starting going off in this direction. There's the uh, uh, lock number four, and you've got the the lower the lower race going off down here. And you can just see a bit of a spillway over here. This is the mill that I was talking about, Norris's roller mill. And you can see it was quite a quite the establishment. Uh, you can see the canal in the background and, and masts for the different ships that were. Uh, uh, navigating through the canal. This, of course, is the, the raceway here in front, the upper race going along. This is a painting uh, of, of the, the same building. Uh, this is a part of their letterhead. Uh, so you can actually see some of the, uh, the, the ships in the canal, the you know, one probably in the lock back here. Uh, this is part of the raceway here. Looks like there's another uh, flume here drawing, you know, drawing excess water off. Uh, it's a photograph, later photograph of the building. Uh, later became part of the uh, Packard Electric uh, Empire. Uh, the Canada Haircloth is another building that was established on the, uh, the raceway. Uh, this, of course, is the lower race uh, in front of the building, which powered it. Uh, this is a view looking down. The, the hair cloth, of course, is here. This is the route of the, the lower raceway. Uh, the middle race was coming through up in, in this direction. Uh, this is looking down from the top of the hill, uh, this is the hair cloth building here. This is the route that the, uh, the raceway was taking at the, at the bottom of the hill. Uh, and this is at the bottom of the hill. I'm, I, I would be standing right in the raceway taking this picture if it still had water in it. And of course, there's this, this lovely uh, red sandstone wall that's uh, still left down there. One of the few remnants of the uh, uh, associated with the raceway. Uh, this, of course, is a, an 1890s picture of the haircloth building. Uh, here's the, the raceway coming through. Uh, and it looks like they've got uh, timbers uh, uh, reinforcing it to keep the, the banks uh, from uh, collapsing in. Uh, McKinnon's Dash uh, seems to have been established along the raceway. And of course, no surprise, there it is flowing in front of the building. Uh, this is probably a, a well and canal towpath. And I'm assuming that this is part of the, uh, the second canal out here. Uh, we had Wood Brothers Tannery, uh, which was shown on this 1913 uh, fire insurance plan. Again, the same configuration, mill race, canal towpath, and then the second canal down here. Uh, this is the, the top of Tannery Road. Tannery Road led from St. Paul Street down to the, uh, around where the, uh, the pear cloth building is. Uh, so the, the raceway was coming along um, down behind this building. And this, this stone foundation here, I think is one of the, the oldest factory building remnants in the downtown area. Uh, you can see it's got these lovely cut limestone uh, coins uh, on, the, on the corners. Uh, limestone construction, uh, it looks like it's been you know, modified at, at, later, uh, at a later point. And right in here, uh, before they they built the the, the walk over towards the um, uh, the, the arena uh, and put this extra fill in, uh, there was like a, a stone archway that's that's buried back in here. And I think that's probably where the water uh, would have come through the building before you know spilling down to the uh, the next level of the uh, the raceway. Uh, this is a, an 1867 view. <clears throat> of the, uh, the second canal, uh, the back of St. Paul Street. Uh, Geneva Street is over here with uh, Phelps's mill. And you've got the, the middle race coming along here, uh, the lower race coming along here in front. And you've got all these 
wonderful um, tanneries and, and grist mills and uh, uh, other industrial buildings that are all making use of the water power um, you know, that the canal brought. Uh, I think that's the old Russell Hotel up there. And one of these buildings, uh, I'd like to know which one uh, was a grist mill that was owned by one of the, uh, the, the hostetters, of course. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm uh, very fond of the, uh, the Hostetter family. Um, even someone like Marion Nelson Hooker uh, thought that this was a, a sufficiently interesting place that uh, you know, she did a, a painting of the, uh, uh, the hydraulic races in the winter. And from this uh, view, you can see the, um, the middle race, the lower race. They still had water in them and even chunks of ice uh, flowing through the, uh, the races of the, uh, in the winter. And uh, no large haircloth building yet, just a, you know, a, a small, small building. Uh, this is an aerial view from the 1920s uh, showing the, the middle and the lower race. Uh, you've got ruins of, of early mill buildings here and here, and you've got spillways. You've got one there, you've got one there. Where the water was dropping from one level to the uh, to the next. Uh, this, of course, is the uh, the old Glen Ridge Bridge, which is no longer there. Uh, this is a lovely panoramic view of what the uh, the back end of St. Paul Street looks like now, where the races were running, uh, called Stilt City. Uh, and of course, if anybody wondered why these buildings are up on stilts, well, it's because you had the raceway running underneath and. If you wanted to expand your building, the footprint of the building, you had to build, you had to build above the raceway. Uh, and the, the whole hillside um, behind St. Paul Street is, is littered with uh, little pieces of uh, quarried and cut uh, sandstone like this. And I think these are, are remnants of the spillways and things that have been demolished. And uh, you know, the, the rocks have just been, just been left where they were. Uh, this is a, a lovely historic view of, of the middle and the lower race. Uh, I don't know the date of this photograph, but I would think it's probably maybe 1870s, 1880s. Uh, they even produced a postcard uh, showing the, uh, the, the canal and the, uh, the races behind St. Paul Street. This is, of course, one of the spillways that showed up in that aerial view. So you can see just how much water was, was coming through the system. Uh, this is a pool photograph uh, showing uh, the, the same spillway with you know, lots of water coming through it. Uh, I guess reinforcements for the, the canal banks. And uh, just, just what are these kids doing here? You know, I mean, one false step and they'd probably end up in the, uh, you know, into the raceway. Uh, another postcard view, there's, there's the same spillway. And these two gentlemen here, if you use them, it gives you some idea of, of the scale um, of what the, the races uh, were like. They were rather wide and uh, about five feet deep. But, uh, this view is looking towards uh, lock three, which was down here. Uh, colored postcard view, I'm sure you've all seen this one. Again, you've got the, the races coming through here. Uh, the different mills and things uh, that were being powered powered by them. Uh, this this shows the uh, the raceway as it's going underneath the old Glen Ridge Bridge. Uh, quite a volume of water going through uh, at that time. Uh, you've got the the stone uh, spillways and uh, reinforcements for it, and it looks like here you've got uh, timbers that are that are bolted together to uh, you know keep the hill from you know, collapsing. And this, of course, is a view looking down from the, uh, the Glen Ridge, or as they called it then, the Ontario Street Bridge, uh, into the raceway, um, you know, showing some of the, the, the sluices and gates and things. Uh, this is uh, lock three of the second well and canal. The Glen Ridge Bridge is back here. St. Paul Crescent is up here. And the hydraulic raceway would have been running I think right along that that high ridge of, of land there. When the uh, the, the Finns uh, first came to St. Catharines, they they lived in a boarding house, 
that was built right beside the old Glen Ridge Bridge. And I don't think it might be, that might be the bottom end of it, uh, like up, up in, in there. So the, the, the raceways were like the, the, the Finns backyard playground. And uh, so here we have uh, one of the early Finnish gentlemen standing on one of the, the bridges, uh, wooden bridges that was built across the raceway. And you can see that uh, the raceway was built again out of timbers that were bolted together. Uh, these ladies, of course, standing on the same same bridge. It's uh, you know you have more of a view of the bridge, and uh, it's it's looking like it's seen better days. Like I wouldn't want to be standing on that thing. Uh, you never know when it's going to give way. Um, and some more of the uh, the fins. Uh, they're here. They're standing on part of the uh, uh, the stone spillway structure, and. Uh, of course, the, the raceway was, was back, back over in here, so there's a bit of a bank in front of it. So um, this area was also a, a place where, you want, where you'd go if you wanted to you know, have a, a quiet romantic interlude, uh, as my grandmother and grandfather uh, are showing here. Uh, they had a quiet moment on the, on the canal bank, on the raceway bank. Uh, the land registry office is full of registered plans that show details of the um, of the raceway. Uh, this is actually it's called Hill Street here, but this was St. Paul uh, Crescent. Uh, so the the paper mills, the Kinleith paper mill, was down in this area. Uh, the Welland Canal is is down here. Taylor and Bates was off in this direction, and here you've got. Um, one section of mill race coming along. Part of it powered the uh, uh, the paper mill, but this one I think was the one that continued on underneath St. Paul Crescent and went off towards uh, Taylor and Bates. Uh, this is a, about a 1920s view of um, the second canal. Uh, this of course is the paper mill that I was talking about. Uh, it was originally I think Merritt's mill. This is where the uh, hydraulic raceway, the, the end of it is spilling out into the canal. This of course is the old uh, Burgoyne Bridge that's no longer there. Uh, here you can see the, uh, the original swing bridge that took uh, St. Paul Crescent from the city side over to uh, towards Rodman Hall. This is the same view now, looks much different. Uh, all the mills are gone, the, the raceway is no longer there. Uh, and this, of course, is looking from the uh, uh, Burgoyne Bridge down towards where Taylor and Bate used to be. And somewhere down in here along Brewery Street uh, was where the, uh, uh, the last section of the raceway came along before spilling into the, uh, uh, the first and second canal. Uh, the leases, uh, the water rights were periodically granted to uh, mill and factory owners. Uh, in 1847, leases were granted to Mr. Merritt, Mr. McGill, Mr. Gibson, and, and Adams. Uh, they actually had leases on entire sections of the mill race. Uh, they were given new leases in 1851, uh, and by, by the late 1880s, Thomas Rodman Merritt also had an interest in it. Uh, they could sublease the, the wastewater uh, coming out of their mills to uh, other uh, factory owners. Uh, the government canceled these leases in 1887, even though the, the leaseholders were entitled to $21,000 uh, for their improvements. Uh, they successfully sued the government in 1909, and the court ordered that they had to uh, pay the plaintiffs in uh, 1911. Uh, this is just an article showing what some of the um, uh, water rates were. Um, for the, the, the raceways, for example, the rental at lock 17 is $200. Um, the rental at lock 16, 18, 19, and 21 for 700 horsepower is 240. And they had uh, different, uh, different rates uh, at, at different locations. Uh, the second canal continued to be used for navigation uh, as far up as St. Catharines until the 1890s. Uh, the raceway remained in use after that as a power canal. 
Uh, we know that uh, a generator or a turbine was installed at the hair cloth factory around 1894. Uh, that was used to power the machinery in the factory and they also sold their, their surplus electricity. Uh, the newspapers reported that the raceway was uh, closed due to a blizzard in February 1894. Uh, that again threw a lot of men out of work for, for several days. And we know that uh, J.B. Grogan was the superintendent of the flow of water into the hydraulic races of the Welland Canal. Uh, he was a uh, conservative, uh, politically he was a conservative. He was dismissed from his office by the Liberal government, but he was uh, reinstated uh, to his former job in uh, 1912. Uh, periodic uh, repairs were necessary to maintain the raceways. We know in, in 1887 that they were driving piles in to shore the raceway up. They were putting fences in to uh, protect uh, the raceway at lock four. Uh, they built uh, masonry walls to keep the banks stable. And they uh, also constructed some floodgates, uh, five by 16 feet in size, which could be closed uh, if they had to shut off the water flow in certain sections of the raceway um, and, and do repairs. Uh, we know that they, the raceway was uh, dewatered in 1900, which caused more closures. Uh, 1912, there was a break in the banks near Riordan's pulp mill in Meriton. Again, that shut things down for a few days. And uh, you know, bridges periodically had to be built. We know in 1914, uh, there was a bridge uh, crossing Claiborne Avenue that was built uh, to convey road traffic over the, uh, the raceway. Uh, between the 1890s and the 1920s, uh, the government uh, threatened to close the second canal uh, and, and, the, the, and the raceway. Uh, they weren't being very well maintained at that point, and the hillside behind St. Paul Street was starting to slip. Um, it was announced that they were going to permanently close things on March the 1st, 1928, and that the mills and factories had to seek alternate power sources. Uh, of course, folks in Thorold and Meriton were really upset about that because they thought that that would negatively impact on the industries. Plus, they would have no way of disposing of their sewage and wastewater. Uh, I guess they were hooking everything right into the, the canal and the raceway. So things are flowing down from Thorold and Meriton through St. Catharines into the 12 Mile Creek and ending up in Port Dalhousie. And there are uh, newspaper articles and editorials in the standard where people in port were complaining and saying, my God, can you not do anything with, with the, to stop the flow of sewage uh, you know, into the 12 Mile Creek uh, on a hot summer's day? You know, Port Dalhousie is getting a little bit, <coughs> you know, a little ripe. Um, by about 1928, 1929, uh, of course, you know, they were still complaining about um, the effects of, of what the closure would, would mean. Uh, in this case, it would affect uh, 2000 plus people, uh, 45 different manufacturing establishments would be affected, uh, 2500 men would be out of work, $50,000 in wages would be lost. Uh, by the summer uh, and fall of 1929, the city of St. Catharines uh, proposed a plan. They wanted to assume control of the hydraulic raceway. Uh, they would incorporate the city's sewage system into it. They would pave over it and it would provide a, a boulevard that would um, relieve the uh, traffic congestion on St. Paul Street. And that uh, boulevard would go from, basically from uh, the bottom of St. Paul Crescent up to uh, Westchester. And after years of negotiations with the federal government, uh, they finally sold the raceways to the city of St. Catharines in 1935. And for the entire two mile length of, uh, of the raceway, uh, the city bought it for $1,000. Uh, by 1938, uh, they were starting to infill. Uh, this is uh, a plan of uh, CP2 Corporation 2. And you can see that this these dotted line areas uh, were where the, the raceways were starting to be filled in. Uh, some sections like this part and then down in here were still open. Uh, presumably they had water flowing in them yet at that point. 
Uh, other parts had sewage systems built into them. And uh, in, that still governs today. When you look down to the um, uh, hair cloth, you can see that there's a, a manhole cover here. There's another one here. So sewage is still flowing downhill and into the, the now buried uh, raceway. Uh, in 1949, uh, the, the portion that was Gale Crescent must have still been a raceway because the city directory uh, refers to like Frank Street from Queenston to the mill race and Lundy's Lane uh, to the mill race, but it doesn't talk about Gale Crescent. Gale Crescent is first named in uh, 1950. So that seems to be the time that uh, it was converted into a street. Uh, by 1954, uh, the city started to, uh, you know, create the, uh, the, the Glen Ridge Fill. Uh, the second canal was being dewatered and filled in. And of course, this is the area where the, uh, the raceways were flowing. They're being uh, channeled in with uh, sewers and covered over. This is the same area, you know, now down behind the uh, uh, the arena and looking towards the, the new Glen Ridge Bridge. Uh, the raceways uh, were a public safety threat from the earliest period. Uh, many people, especially children, would fall into the raceways and they would be swept away and drowned. Uh, as late as October 1923, city staff were ordered to investigate measures, either police patrols or fencing, to try and stop people from falling into the raceways. Uh, in uh, 1859, uh, Mr. McIntyre, our cabinet maker, uh, his son named Donald Alexander was drowned in the lower mill race while he was swimming. Uh, he didn't realize how deep the water was and could not swim. And he got, you know, swept away um, uh, by the waters. And here it says that the mill races are fatal to children. Um, Every year, one or more are drowned at this spot, and yet no effort uh, that we are aware of has been made to prevent such melancholy occurrences. And parents should take pains to warn their children against, you know, bathing at this spot. Uh, the, McIn the McIntyre loss must have been really heartbreaking. This is a page from uh, McIntyre's coffin register from 1859. And right here, you see the entry for their son that uh, drowned in the raceway and they just I guess they couldn't bear to write his name out in full or put in any other details they just put his initials down and and that was it but adults also fell into the raceway uh, we have uh, Margaret Sullivan uh, she was found in the the mill race behind Mr. McIntyre's cabinet uh, shop um, they, they weren't sure whether she met her end violently uh, because she had a, a cut on her head. Uh, but uh, the last time she was seen alive was during the circus performance. And uh, then she was found uh, drowned in the, uh, the mill race. Uh, this is another page from McIntyre's coffin register for Margaret Sullivan of St. Catharines. Uh, she had uh, a, a stained coffin and, and a box. And uh, she was five feet, six inches uh, in height, found drowned, and her funeral cost $10. Anyway, I want to uh, thank uh, Dennis and Arden for their assistance in this uh, uh, slide presentation. They, they gave me a few really good photographs and, and, uh, and uh, advice on what to do. That's all, folks. Former, I mean, if we knew, if you know the street. Uh, thank you. Yes, if anybody has questions, yeah, questions. Yeah, Brian, I see one in the uh chat here. It's uh from uh, Wes Turner. Why did the government cancel the leases in 1887? <sighs> I, I think I think by that point, because the, the third canal had been opened and the second canal was <clears throat> seen as being a, um, it was becoming redundant. It wasn't suitable for navigation. And um, I think it was just, just a cash drain on the government because they had to maintain it. 
So by canceling the leases, uh, that was like the first step that they would take towards eventually decommissioning the canal. But there was enough of an outcry from all the uh, industries and local inhabitants that they they sort of deferred, uh, you know, putting off the closure of the canal, but they did keep it watered. Um, but they didn't want, you know, all the, the fuss and bother of, of leases. Yeah. Are there any pictures? Or are you through? Yep. Yep. Are there any pictures of the Red Mill? Um, I believe there are, but um, I, I didn't uh, didn't really include uh, you know any of them. Uh, I think I think it shows up in one of those early views that I I, I had at the beginning of the talk. It wasn't. It wasn't the the building in the in your introduction. Well, that was that was a a, a building that was built later. But uh, there, I think there was that. I think it was one of the eighteen fifties engravings that had a uh, a little glimpse of it. Well, the Red Mill was earlier than that because the first service of of First Presbyterian Church was there in the eighteen thirties. Yeah, well, the mill was built, I think, in, in um, between about 1828 and 1831. Probably. The, but the, the stone building that was there was um, enlarged uh, and added to, I think, in the 1870s and 80s. Brian, it's John Finney here. Isabel has her hand up. Oh. oh yeah. is Isabel. Thank you. I really enjoyed that, Brian. Thank you. Um, Thank you just to comment. Um, I do know a little bit about where the beginning of the race uh, was at um, in Meriton, and it was actually between um, Riordan's and uh, Goose Island or Ball Avenue West, uh, halfway in between there. And I understand that there is still um, a trace of the stonework um, that was located when they were um, when Colleen and Rene were doing the research for the historical Welland Canals mapping project. And I believe they have it marked on that map, which is accessible online. So was, was that up in um, like the Mountain Locks area? or Yes, it was, it was much higher though, um, not uh, the lower part where the new development is. It, this is um, uh, south of uh, Riordan's higher up at the top of the escarpment rather than lower down. Oh, that high up. I didn't that realize high up, that. yes. Yeah. Ah. And there is apparently a trace of stonework still uh, there. And I believe it's marked on that map. I haven't been to explore it recently, uh, but I understand it is marked on that. So if anyone's interested, um, they should be able to find it oh, by, really? by oh, tracking okay. that through the map. Wow. Right. Okay, yeah, thanks. thanks. Um, John, uh, you had a, a question? Not a question, just a comment. Just watching the, uh, the images here, I was quite impressed with the fact that the raceways, the way they were laid out, one above the other, upper, middle and lower, made very exceedingly good use of what water they had because the, the mill at the top could discharge the water into the second level and the mills that, there, that were there could then discharge the same water into the lower raceway and all mills were able to make use of the waters that came through from, uh, from the upper levels. Pretty oh, clever yeah, design. Yeah, and, and of course everybody was cashing in because like I say, the uh, the leaseholders uh, of each level of the of the raceway could then charge other people to use the water that they had already had already come through their factory. So you know, there was like double dipping in a way. Yeah, I was going to say exactly that. Money always raises its head, doesn't it? <laughs> no. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Gail. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, the photographs and your ar the archival work and perhaps whatever photographs Dennis and Arden offered were wonderful, but your own photography, I know you're a great photographer and you've, you've really 
brought it forward for me exactly where these places are in St. Catharines today by going out on your own and taking the photographs. I do have one question. You mentioned um, uh, one of the raceway developers was Matthew Sexsmith. That would be an ancestor of Ron Sexsmith, the musician. I wonder that too. <laughs> yeah, I, I have no idea about that. Ah, um, I, ah. I wondered if they were um, uh, American contractors that Got came it. over. Well, it's um, an unusual name. And I mean, Ron and his family have been here. I've met his brother once uh, for a long time. I just wonder, yeah, if anyone's looked into that genealogy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Gail, that is your task. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's my question. Thank you. Right. You're a great photographer. Uh, the, the other thing, you know, that, that struck me too about these, these raceways as I, because I basically walk the route from you know Lincoln Ave to you know the the high level bridge, uh, and and it just struck me you know how sad it is that you had this this feature that brought so much prosperity and it, it had such importance to St Catharines, mm -hmm. and it's completely filled in and there's hardly any traces left of it. Uh, you know it, it's so sad. You know it, they really should be. Um, commemorated somehow with a, a commemorative plaque or something mm -hmm. and uh you know and and to have maybe some kind of marking along the route so that people know you know the, the, the ground that they're walking on used to yeah. be the uh, uh a raceway an industrial raceway uh michael from vermont you have a question mm -hmm. yeah first off i've got to tell you that was phenomenal i really enjoyed this and uh i had only known about the lower race with i didn't know how far they came up or where they began that so phenomenal job just Thank a question you. with the sharing of water between the canal and the raceway were there ever issues that there wasn't enough water in the canal or they took too much off because i can understand the lakes the uh lock would need a lot of water and you wouldn't want to drain a mill uh during times were there ever issues between the two sharing the water um th there were i think more during the uh, the time of the first canal uh the i think that's probably why there were more um you know uh feeders and stuff that were created uh for the second canal you know it, it increased the flow of the water um i think the main sticking point that everybody had between the the uh, businesses on the raceway and the well on canal was the fact that the factories would be discharging uh some of their garbage like uh, you know, sawdust from the sawmills and things like that, into the raceways that went into the canal, and that would start um, impeding shipping. Gotcha, gotcha. Fantastic, just awesome job you did. This was super. Okay, thanks. There's one other question in the uh, chat thing there. Um, I see a comment. It says, uh, this is, says, you did I mention to finish. Oh. So you did mention that sewage was added to the raceways. So I have to think that those who use the water at the end of the raceway would have had really nasty water to use and it must have smelled badly in their factories. Uh, that's probably a good guess. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I said, the, the people in Port Dalhousie were complaining about stinky water coming down the 12 mile creek and you know affecting you know people who wanted to use lakeside park because you know by that point you had thorold meriton and st catharines all dumping their sewer into the canal and into the raceway and it was all you know flowing down towards lake ontario would be different good. world than what we live in for sure trying the last out. user was the brewery what was that the last user was the brewery. Well, if you if you brewed stuff out of that water, then hopefully it you know got rid of any parasites. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. It's good beer. That's just. I see Hugh Fraser's hand up. Yeah, Brian, that was excellent, excellent. I really enjoyed that. Um, I just wanted you to make a comment that given today's environmental restrictions, do you think it would even be possible to have done the raceways under today's uh, standards back then? Yeah, well, 
again, like I say, diff different world. I mean, you know, the Victorian Victorian ideas of sanitation and and uh, work safety and everything was, you know, totally different from ours. So. If we if we imposed our standards on them, no, it probably couldn't be done. Plus, yeah. plus you know, all the, the safety, right. health and safety issues. I mean, to have an open waterway uh, at least 16 feet or more wide and about five feet deep with a torrent of water racing through it with no safety fencing up and everything else. Um, and, you know, just allowing people to drop into it and, uh, and, and then there was some question too about the about the raceways. Uh, if they were closed up, would people start using them for you know dumping garbage into them? Would they dump their dead animals into them? Uh, you know this sort of thing. And uh, you know and they'd be a, a breeding ground for mosquitoes if they had stagnant water sitting in them. So there were all these health and safety issues surrounding them that uh, I never thought about that until I started researching it and seeing all these little tidbits of information popping up in the, the newspaper editorials. So uh, it, 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 the whole raceway issue raises just a lot of questions and, and unanswered questions and <laughs> different ways of looking at things. Thank you. Are there any more questions? I'm just trying to look at my screen. Well, I, uh, could I comment? Yes. Uh, uh, I have learned a tremendous amount tonight, and I think that it's kind of sad that people of St. Catharines know so little about this history. I wish a whole lot more people than, than this small group had seen it. Um, I don't know how, how we could manage to, to spread this further, but uh, it, it's something that needs to be done. And, and as Brian said, life is so different now. And th th that is a, one of the things that hit me really is how different life was and how, how very different life was in the 19th century. Well, I, I'm actually thinking with the, uh, the Canal Bicentennial coming up that uh, maybe something like this talk on the, uh, the raceways could be expanded and uh, possibly turned into a, a, a book or a pamphlet or something, uh, you know, as part of the, the bicentennial celebrations. And certainly the, the Heritage Committee could, uh, you know, put some plaques up, you know, different places throughout the city. And, uh, you know, at least if, if there's some publication that comes out of this, uh, it's, it's something permanent that, you know, we won't totally lose, lose sight of the the history of, of the raceways and the importance that they had. So you heard it here, folks. Look for a book coming out. <laughs> Bryce, I see one last question here. It says, has a 3D model of the raceway system downtown ever been built? No. Hmm. Maybe that's another thing for the, uh, <laughs> the, the bicentennial. Hugh is very good with Legos. He could do it. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought of that. Yeah. Or model railroaders who, you know, know how to do things. You could combine the two, uh, NS and T and, uh, you know, the hydraulic raceway and, and the canal. It could make a lovely, uh, you know, panorama, diorama, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. They could they could build this with three D printers now. This is this is uh, it's not that hard to do anymore. Well, we've got a three D printer at the uh, downtown library, so there you go. Library staff, get ready. We're coming. Museum. And also, just a comment. Uh, I I noticed it uh, in the chat. Uh, we this will be on our U, uh, our historical society YouTube station, so. Promote it through that as much as you can. I'm, I'm thinking of Bob Halfyard's question. How do we promote this? Well, we've got our own YouTube station, so this will soon be up. Make, make a documentary of it. Yeah. 
Okay, so I, I think the otherwise that's it for the questions. Um, so this comes from uh, the time where I thank Brian for his presentation. Once you know, we always rely on Brian, typically about once a year to give a presentation. Uh, he never lets us down. So that was, this was a great presentation. We actually had really good turnout today as well too so glad to hear so thank you brian for your presentation and as brian was saying you know with the you know the, the bicentennial the welland canal coming up this is probably going to be a big topic in the coming years so this is considered as one of the the, the first of um, i'm sure other you know topics or you know articles in the newsletter to follow over the next few years on the on the beginnings of the welland canal so um with that note just want to end things off we do have a presentation as we normally do in February. It'll be on February 24th. Uh, it is Dr. Ian Ellingham, local architect, chair of the Niagara Society of Architects, and it's uh, entitled An, Economic, sorry, An Economist Looks at Heritage. Um, so we look forward to seeing everyone there. And again, February 24th, same as always for Thursday of the month. So thank you again, Brian. Look forward to seeing everyone next month and I'll say goodbye now. Bye. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.